Welcome back to the Watch More Podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris. You're dialed in for episode 212. And uh, what a great episode we just had there about voting and all things early voting. Man, I was super stoked about that and appreciate Lenny being on that show with us here, kind of giving some insight. So this episode, I want to tackle particularly the Federal Reserve. We got a Fed meeting coming up this week. Super stoked about that. We all know exactly what we think is going to happen, right? But in this episode, I'm going to tackle exactly what I think is going to happen pretty much and why and more in this episode at What's Your One More. Okay, it's Fed Week, folks. And if you're in the mortgage industry, if you're in the real estate industry, if you're a buyer, if you're a seller, this is your Super Bowl week, right? Because this is where we start to see what I've been talking about, this behavior from the Federal Reserve that just doesn't really go away. What I mean by that is this is an addictive policy they get a part of, right? It's very hard for the Federal Reserve to, when they do something, not continue to do it for an extended period of time. And history shows us that. And uh, what I want to do is I want to bring up a graph here. And if you're listening, tune into our YouTube channel at What's Your One More with the number one at What's Your One More with the number one. Get a copy of these graphs here. But the first one is from the Federal Reserve. And basically, it's a history from 2005 forward on here. And what I'm showing in this particular graph is the peaks and valleys of the Fed funds rate. Obviously, we've talked about why that's important, what it's attached to, and what it does to the market, but also what it can do to mortgage rates. And adamantly in this particular graph, I drew a couple of trend lines on here that show the Fed's policy predictions based on 2024 year end all the way through 2025. And what you'll find in some of these dotted lines is that the Federal Reserve says, hey, listen, their forecast by the end of 2024 was to be around that 4.4 Fed funds rate, right? And so what is it going to take to get to that, right, at the beginning of this? And their Fed funds rate for 2025 forecast is 3.4. Now, that's a mixed bag. You got eight meetings in that policy here, but 3.4 from where we are now. So what does that even mean? Obviously, these are forecasts. They're not guarantee. But what you're seeing is exactly what I mentioned about four episodes ago. And what was that? It was that once the Fed starts doing this reduction, they don't stop. And they're admittedly saying, hey, listen, we're trying to get back to neutral. And for those in our audience, neutral on the Fed funds rate, somewhere between three and a quarter and three and a half. So that 3.4 makes sense. But if I go down here and I take a look at one of my favorite uh, metrics on here, this is from the CME group, where they do like a Fed watch prediction, right? If I go and take a look at that, there's a 95% live right now, 95% chance that the Federal Reserve does the quarter. And we all know the quarter reduction has been on the table. Um, that's nothing new. So 95% of, uh, of, of, you know, basically, I, I'm not saying betting, but there's a 95% chance here that quarters in the bag, right? Influence. And these guys have pretty been dialed in on this target rate. That takes us to four and a half and four, seven, five target rate. So what does that do for mortgage rates? Well, you know, it could offer some relief. You know, when we got the 50 basis points last Fed funds meeting, we got a little bit of relief, but then we got a shock to the market. We did a whole episode on why that happened that way. And, you know, if you're in mortgages right now, you kind of feel like, hey, man, what is it going to take to get these rates down? Because we've seen everything kind of go up. There's been no relief coming. Again, we talked about that in the episode of what tends to happen. And you kind of saw it happen here just a little bit. We almost got there. And what I mean by that is this. As the 10-year treasury starts to get closer to this Fed funds rate, right? And right now, the 10-year treasury, as I'm doing this episode, is somewhere between 4, 2, 4, 3, right? And if they cut the Fed funds rate to four and a half, that's pretty close. Well, the money market rates are based on this, the treasuries and uh, short term and long term. It's a blend, but a lot of that's derived directly from this. The closer we get to those numbers, you're going to see big money leave those money markets and make their way into longer term, longer term notes. And quite honestly, does make sense. And that's going to drive more traffic and price pressure and bring that down. That's kind of that full life circle we talked about of what will happen there, but that does take time. Any way you cut it, the lowering of the Fed funds rate doesn't necessarily mean rates are going down, but it does provide some momentum for that to happen amongst the things that take place once that uh, lowering of the rate of the Fed funds rate takes place. So let's take a look at this. What's driving that market? You know, for me, it's real simple. It's jobs over inflation. It's employment data over inflation. At this point, inflation, I'm not saying is in the bag, but I mean, it's pretty stagnant right now. We haven't seen like this pop either up or down. You know, as I pull up my notes here, this morning as I'm doing this, we got the PCE rating in. And for those that don't know what that is, that's the personal consumption expenditures. And we talk about that one because that's the Federal Reserve's favorite form of inflation. Came in this morning and they look at the core reading, right? That's their big one. There's two types of readers, the headline and there's the core. It came in right at exactly what they thought it would be. And so because of that, you know, they, on the core, month over month, they forecasted a 0.2 and it came in at 0.1, right? So it, it came in a little bit lower than expected. The markets are a little favorable with that, but again, it's winning the battle on the core. We stayed at 2.7. 
right? So we're 2.7 and the forecast was 2.7. So we came in at expectations on the year over year, meaning that we still have a two handle on the inflation uh, index that the Federal Reserve looks at. And the reason I, I kind of dwell on this is because for the longest time, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell would come to the podium post meetings, even before meetings, and said, listen, our target rate of inflation is 2%. You know, one of their policies, one of their mandates was to get to 2%. And, and then the next mandate was on employment. And that's why I think at this point, employment is over inflation and unemployment in particular. So let's take a look at some jobs numbers here because we did get a jobs. This is jobs week. You know, I'm recording this on Thursday. The BLS comes out on Friday. I thought about even waiting for this episode and recording Friday after the BLS report, but why? I mean, why? I've, I've gone on why it's the BS report at this point. I mean, it's completely, I'm not going to say it's useless, but I'm going to break down a couple of things here I think are relevant, important. Again, if you want to see some of these charts I'm about to break out here, go to our YouTube channel, watch your one more because I think you'll find some of this stuff slightly kind of interesting and more importantly, discouraging, which is why I said, hey, you know what? We got the ADP reports. We got enough on the jobless claims. Let's just talk about this in the episode. So one of the first things I want to talk about on here is let's talk about the JOLTS report, right? And why is that important? We haven't really done an episode on that, really haven't dove into it, but this is the job openings report, right? And the less amount of jobs that are open traditionally is a not a good sign for the economy. It's also a favorable sign for mortgage rates and bonds. And because it essentially says job, if I have less openings on a job report, right, if the number's going down, there's less likelihood of employees jumping ship to another employer because there's less jobs available. I mean, that kind of makes sense when you think about it. So if I, like, if you go back to a thriving employment market, right, and you could probably even argue late 21 was a thriving employment market and people were saying, hey, listen, I'm going to go job hop to this because they're paying me more to go over here and I can work from home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they just jumped. They just jumped and made a job hop, job hop, if you may. When the market is the reversal of that and the openings are coming down, you may say, oh, all right, I'm going to stay where I'm at and I'm not going to look around because there's really nothing out there that I've, I mean, maybe I do look around, but there's nothing out there. So I'm going to stay on my job. So there's less likelihood of recruiting. There's less poaching and employees tend to stay put at their current employer versus jumping around as there's less openings on this jolt report. So that's kind of why it's getting the attention now. And so it was down at 7.4 million versus 8 million. So that was that raised in my brows, kind of the market's going, eh, okay. And then here's the biggest thing that kind of goes with what I was talking about, the quit rate inside of there, meaning how many people quit their jobs, whether they're going to another job or just say, screw it, I'm out. The quit rate was one of the lowest quit rates that we've seen pre-pandemic since 2015. So that kind of bodes a notion of, okay, it's – Again, job market, is it strong? Is it weak? You know, if the job openings are shrinking and the quit rate is going down, I would argue that you don't have as thriving of a job market. You might have a little bit of stability with all that, but you don't have a, you don't have a thriving market. Now, what's interesting is that you don't know how many people are being laid off in that until we get those unemployment numbers that come out again on Friday. Are they real? Are they not? Who knows? But the reality is until we see those unemployment numbers, you really can't tie the two together yet. But the reality is it doesn't look like the jolts index is telling us that the job market is improving. And when we go into that report, we look at leisure and hospitality. And the reason we've been looking at leisure and hospitality is because that's been the leading forefront of job openings for quite some time. And that makes sense. Coming out of the pandemic, that was always the one that rebounded the last, but also has the most excuse me grounds to make up. Well, I mean, it had a negative 111,000 in this report, meaning it had less – there's just less 111,000 jobs – prior to. And so that's interesting because, you know, in the jobs report on the actual BLS side, it said there were 78,000 people being hired. Remember I went on that rant about bartenders? Yeah, but this report says the complete opposite, negative 111,000. To the point, the jobs report says 78,000 people took jobs. Inside of this report, it's a negative 1,000 people were hired for that position. So, that's a reversal of a negative 79,000. That's this report, this JOLTS report is contradicting the BLS report. Again, that's why I'm not waiting until Friday to do this episode because uh, quite frankly, it's just, I, I don't think it's worth the paper it's written on. And one of the things I ranted on, if you remember, I went down this whole rabbit hole about government jobs, right? And how this household survey basically, excuse me, this the household survey indicated there was 785,000 government jobs created during that PLS report on the unemployment side of things. The household survey says 785,000 government jobs created while the private establishments only created 31,000 jobs. And that's brought that unemployment rate down, down to the 4.1 number that it was at 
when, you know, you kind of look at some of the, the analytics I did on previous, I think it was like three or four episodes ago where I showed that should have been 4.5. If you used the consistent measurement of government jobs in that particular analyzation of unemployment, that number should have been more 4.5, not 4.1. So this JOLTS report, if you may, kind of contradicts the BLS report and really adds to my argument, which is they're saying, hey, in the government side of things, we were off negative 22,000 hirings. And then we also have 132 openings. Now, this is a vast difference from what the other reports are. And this is also being looked at and analyzed by the Federal Reserve, meaning they're seeing this stuff as well. And I go back to jobs are leading the way, right? So yesterday, being Wednesday, I'm recording on Thursday, the ADP private sector came out. And it kind of really just blew expectations out of the water, right? Almost doubled expectations. But then the revisions came in. And it completely wiped out all the gains. And again, we're starting to see these massive seasonal revisions that kind of contradict the numbers that are coming out. And so I do think the Federal Reserve seeing this and where I'm going with this is the job market doesn't look as strong as it does on paper. And I'm not saying this is not an administration thing. This is not an election thing. This is a, hey, listen, and you heard me say it in the last episode with Lenny when we were talking about voting. Whoever comes into office, they are going to inherit a job market that is not very strong in comparison to what it was a year ago. And it's it, showing signs of continuing to weaken versus improving. And so I share that with you because this applies pressure to the Federal Reserve, which is why foregoing conclusion, all this information and data is coming in right at the week of the Fed funds, or excuse me, the Federal Reserve meeting next week. The quarter is in the bag. Like I think the whole entire industry would be shocked if it was more than that, or even if there was a pause. Now, could the BLS come in tomorrow and just absolutely wreak havoc? Maybe. But I think this is what's done is done. I think the Fed's course is we're going to cut a quarter, putting us in that four and a half, four, seven, five range, which is going to bode the question of we've gotten pretty darn close to the 10 year treasury on that. Does big money start to make its way out of the mutual funds? And does that 10 year return start to become far more attractive, thus applying price pressure, driving that down? which is an immediate impact to mortgage rates and mortgage-backed securities. That's where the wind comes in. So it's actually good news that goes down, and it's actually good news that the 10-year is right close to it because we'll start seeing more money move towards that. And as more demand goes into the 10, the more the price goes down, and that does lead the way for mortgage rates. That's extremely important here because there's this notion – and if you're in the mortgage industry, I'd love to hear from you. Please comment on our YouTube channel at What's Your One More. Even hit us up on our socials at What's Your One More with the number one. But I mean, how many people do you have sitting on the sidelines right now that are saying, ah, I'm just going to wait till the election's over with? I'm going to wait till the election's over before I do anything, whether I refi, whether I purchase, as if that makes a difference in your ability to own a home, right? Or to get the cash out. However, I got a theory. I think there's so much volatility in the election era and people feeling some sort of way about one side and the other side. I think no matter who wins this, I think the opposing or the opposition group, they're the people that are going to refi and they're going to take cash out of their homes. And they're going to say, you know what? You just don't know what's going to happen. And they're going to literally take that out. I also think the impending credit card debt is a really big deal. And I think we're going to see debt consolidation coming out of the holiday season for that as well. It traditionally happens, but it's much higher rate right now, excuse me, rate of debt on there that'll be refinanced out. But I do think you're going to see a wave in that regardless of rates. And I also think you're going to see rates come down because you saw my forecast at the mid-year. Every single time we have an election, there's a dip in transactions, and then it just goes through the roof by March. We're at the dip point right now. If you're in the industry, I'm sure you're agreeing with me. Transactions are not as of a plenty as they were six months ago. This is a direct impact to the election season right now. Once this season is done, and it'll be done by Tuesday after this episode is airing on Thursday, this episode will air on Wednesday, the day after the election, right? That's when we'll start seeing some stuff pick up. Reality will set in. What's done is done. The nervousness, the anxiety. I saw a survey. Lenny said it on the podcast. There is 69% of America is experiencing anxiety over the election. Once that all subsides and goes away and everyone gets their bearing straight, you'll see transactions pick up. And hopefully, hopefully, it could pair off with some pretty decent rates here that we've all been anticipating for quite some time. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I can't, rate, can't wait to analyze what takes place on Tuesday all the way to the evening of Wednesday morning on our next episode. It's going to be a fun episode for us to talk about policies and what it means for housing for the new candidate and the person that is going to be the president of the United States afterwards. So if you haven't got a chance to vote, get out there and do it. I know it's a little late, but make sure that uh, I hope you took place in the vote. I'm actually saying that because I'm recording this before the election. So guys, if you like what you're hearing, please 
five star review this podcast. Tune into our channels on Apple, Spotify, and on YouTube. Love the feedback. Thanks for all the shout outs. And you know, we had one special listener on there that said, "Hey, man, I've been so confused about the housing market. I'm hearing so many negativity things. That episode you did debunking the 13 myths of why the market was supposed to crash, but it didn't really help me out." He goes, "I know there's tremendous demand and the price points are holding. I just need to hear it from another angle, man." Shout out to you. Thanks for putting that out there. And uh, to all of our listeners, we'll see you at the next episode at What's Your One More. Got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah.